markets in New York City. This is Maria Bartiromo's Wall Street. Happy weekend. Welcome to the program that analyzes the week that was and helps position you for the week ahead. I'm Maria Bartiromo. Thanks for joining us. Coming up in just a few moments, Carlisle's co-CEO, Kusong Lee, is my special guest this weekend. First, though, Deirdre Bolton is standing by in the Fox Business newsroom. She has the big headlines from everything uh, from Wall Street to Main Street. Deirdre. Thanks, Maria. Investors witnessing history this week. Apple became the first public company to cross the $1 trillion mark in value. The iPhone maker reported strong earnings on Wednesday that sent the stock soaring and eventually hit the trigger number of $207.04 per share on Thursday. Apple is up more than 20% this year, outpacing the Dow, the S&P 500, and the NASDAQ. Investors reacted well to the Friday jobs report for July. Unemployment ticked lower to 3.9%. 157,000 jobs were added to the U.S. economy. Investors shook off concerns about U.S.-China trade tensions, and markets finished in the green for the week. In the bond market, U.S. 10-year Treasury yields rose above 3%, crossing that key level on Wednesday for the first time since June. The yield is a benchmark for mortgage and auto lending rates, and it was driven higher due to a strong private payroll report. Meanwhile, the controversy is growing surrounding CBS's Les Moonves. The magazine The New Yorker published an article citing six women who say that Moonves made unwanted sexual advances towards them. Some of the sexual harassment allegations date prior to his move to CBS in 1995. The board of CBS is supporting Moonves for the time being. He is keeping his chairman and CEO roles while the investigation into his behavior is underway. Moonves did speak on a Thursday earnings call but made no comments about the inquiry. The White House announcing Thursday that it plans to freeze anti-pollution and fuel efficiency regulation in cars. The regulations were implemented in 2012. They force automakers to raise cars' fuel efficiency to 54 miles per gallon by 2025. The Trump administration claims the regulations will hurt jobs and force Americans to pay more for their cars. California says it will fight the decision. Maria, back to you. Thank you, Deirdre. As you just heard, the markets are continuing to navigate the threat of a uh, trade war or trade dispute with China, especially after the news that the administration may raise its current tariffs on Chinese goods from 10 percent to 25 percent. I spoke with Commerce Secretary Wilbur Ross on my morning program, Mornings with Maria, on Thursday. I asked him about the administration's strategy today. Reason for the tariffs to begin with was to try to convince the Chinese to modify their behavior. Instead, they've been retaliating. So the president now feels that it's potentially time to put more pressure on in order to modify their behavior. We have to create a situation where it's more painful for them to continue their bad practices than it is to reform them. Reaction now from Muddy Waters Capital, Chief Investment Officer Carson Block joining me right now. Carson, good to see you this morning. Thanks so much for joining us. Yeah, thank you. So what do you think about the president's strategy against China? We know what China has been doing. Their economic aggression has threatened the technologies of the United States. Intellectual property has been stolen for decades. And the Chinese force this transfer of technology from American companies to tech companies uh, in China. So what do you think? Is the administration right to push back here? Well, absolutely. I, I do have to hand it to the Trump administration for really identifying the threat that China poses to our way of life. I mean, this is, this is, in my view, China for some time has had a concerted strategy to transfer economic wealth from the West, from the U.S. to China. And so, you know, finally, government is realizing that and looking to push back. Um, you know, my corner is obviously capital markets. That's the one area, though, where I don't think the government understands what's happening. And so that's, yeah, that's basically I what I think we that. need to... Tell us what mm -hmm. you think is happening. I mean, there are a lot of Chinese companies listed on American exchanges, from the New York Stock Exchange to NASDAQ and uh, among others. Uh, do, what is your sense of what's happening that this administration is not aware of? So there are really four legs of what China is doing in the capital markets to damage our interests. 
The most obvious is the China hustle, um, where you've had literally hundreds of frauds list in the U.S. from China the past decade, raise and steal tens and tens of billions of dollars, and basically nobody from the China side has been, pu has been punished. That's one. But also on the U.S. side, we're financing Alibaba, we're financing Baidu and other Chinese companies that are acquiring key technologies from the U.S. So we're using the capital markets to finance the degradation of our strategic technological advantage. Over in Hong Kong, you have a similar wealth transfer scheme going on where lots of U.S. money that's in these index funds, basically these index funds are indiscriminately buying into stock manipulations and frauds, once again transferring U.S. wealth. And the fourth leg is also in Hong Kong where we've seen companies that receive illegal state subsidies um, that to dump their products in the U.S. are also committing significant stock fraud to, you, to lure Western money into the equity markets to provide a further subsidy to help dump their product. So those are the four areas that I can see from my perch. You know, it's interesting because the administration has been using tariffs as a way to get China to stop its behavior in terms of stealing IP and enforcing the transfer of technology. And China is retaliating. It's pushing back. Are tariffs the right tool for this administration to use to get China to change its behavior and bad practices? That, that's a... That. My view that that's not going to be enough. I mean, if we're talking purely on trade issues, I have a view that possibly differs from that of many of the people in the administration. I do think that the international trading system is a very good system. We built it in our image. There's one major player at the table who does not play by the rules. So from my perspective, much more coordinated or concerted action by the other major trading nations to force China to play by the rules would be helpful. Yeah, but doesn't, doesn't this totally open the U.S. up to upset because China has been such an important market for U.S. companies? I mean, even though the fraud is there and the Chinese won't even allow real access, that you have to own 49 percent of a joint venture and, and, and partner up with the Chinese company and they'll own 51 percent, still... The Chinese market, 1.3 billion people, is important for American companies. So if we start pushing back on even Chinese listings, doesn't that hurt American companies ultimately? Well, I th one of the things that I think we really need to talk about in this conversation with China and the U.S. is in order to realign things to benefit the U.S. long term or to really counteract the detriment to the U.S. over the long term, there will be short-term pain. Carson, it's good to have you on the program. Thanks so much. Thank you. We'll see you soon. Carson Block, Muddy Waters Capital. More Wall Street when we come right back. Trade trouble with China has hit stocks hard, but has it had the same effect on private equity? By and large, the global, global economy is still steadily growing. One of the biggest names in the private equity game spells it out when Wall Street returns. Welcome back. The Carlyle Group's Kusong Lee has emerged as a prominent player in the world of private equity. When David Rubenstein and his two co-founders announced late last year they were stepping aside, the firm announced that Lee and Glenn Youngkin would take over day-to-day -day management. Currently, Carlyle has more than uh, $200 billion in assets under management. It just closed its biggest fund yet, raising more than $18 billion from investors. Kusong, it's great to have you on the program this morning. Thank you for having me. Thank here, you so much for joining us. And, of course, we've got 300 companies to look at under the umbrella of the Carlyle Group. So I want to get your take on what you're looking at, what you're seeing from those uh, companies that you own, and what that tells us about the broader economy. So how sure. do you characterize things right now? Sure, it's a, gr a great question. So through our portfolio companies, we do have a really good sense for what's happening in the global economy. And I would say by and large, the global economy is still steadily growing, but we're starting to see some interesting things. So first of all, the U.S., it feels like the U.S. is a bit stronger now than it was last year. I would say trend, we would put it at 3 3.5% growth. Um, China, it feels like China is still growing but has slowed down a bit. Uh, instead of growing at six plus percent, I would say it's more in the five to you know six percent range. Five and, to six, wow. yeah, that and, is a big slowdown. Yeah, it has slowed down a bit. And I would say in Europe what we're seeing is 
unlike last year where we were seeing trend at about two and a half percent, it has also slowed a little bit and we're seeing it more in the two percent range. So overall, global growth is still good. The U.S. is chugging along. It feels like the U.S. is the strongest relative to the other economies. And we are seeing a little bit of slowdown. Now, I don't know if that's a trend. But we are noticing that. It's interesting that you mentioned that because Europe was a place that we were all very happy about, two and a half percent right. growth, that, that we were seeing right. a real turnaround in Europe. Is this partly due to the tariffs, do you think? Is this just um, e economies that, I mean, when you look at China, it's been growing for so long? I mean, w what is behind yeah, the slowdown, know, do you think, away from the United States? It, it, great question, because I think in China what's happened is I do think there has been a little bit of a bump down in consumer confidence because of all the trade and tariff talk and the constant drumbeat of, of that in the news. Also, don't forget the Chinese stock markets are off about 20%. Real estate hasn't really gone up. And so we do see a little bit of a pullback in China. In Europe, it's a combination of lower spending, as well as I, you, you can't help but think that Brexit hanging out over there is having an impact. Now, what's interesting, though, is that sets the stage for potentially divergent central bank policy. And we are definitely seeing that now, because if you think about it, the United States, the Fed, is actually on, on a mission, as you know, of raising rates right now. We do think there'll be two raise, uh, uh, rates will rise two times between now and the end of the year. China's all, all the way on the other end of the spectrum. They're actually easing. If you think about Chinese SHIBOR, which is their equivalent of LIBOR, it's gone from about a little bit less than 5% to a little bit greater than 3% in just six months. So they're going in the opposite direction. Mm. And the ECB in Europe, quite frankly, it feels to me like they're kind of trying to figure it all out. And there's a sense that it's a bit of a look and see approach where they are trying to take down quantitative easing and position themselves to maybe raise rates in the future. But they're kind of in between what the U.S. Central Bank is doing and what China is doing. Well, the earnings season in the U.S. has been very strong. And um, the narrative of things slowing down in the next couple of years has to do with the Federal Reserve raising interest rates. And then, of course, this idea that as we see these tariffs take effect, it will impact margins. Are right. you seeing margin pressure in the U.S.? So definitely input prices are starting to tick up from wages transportation logistics we're seeing that happening i think the sixty four thousand dollar question is going to be can corporations push through higher input prices if they can you're going to see broader inflationary uh, tendency if they can't you're going to see corporate earnings get hit You've got your hand in a lot of businesses. I want to take a break, but when we come back, I want to ask you about how you're allocating capital today. And now that you're seeing this change in terms of a slowdown, slower than you thought, in Europe, does that change how you allocate capital in Europe as well? So stay with us. Kusang, uh, please don't go anywhere. We've got a lot more to come right here on Wall Street. Back in a minute. The economy has been booming, but could a slowdown be on the horizon? When you have a strong economic environment, that does not necessarily translate to a great investing environment. The Carlyle Group's Q Song Lee says it's possible and explains why when Wall Street returns. China's new threat. Welcome back. We have a special guest this weekend on Wall Street, the co-CEO of private equity giant Carlyle Group. Kusang Lee is with us this weekend. And Kusang, we're talking about investing today sure. in an environment where we did just see a great earnings period in the United States, certainly the second quarter, 20 percent plus growth in profits and a great GDP number. The jobs number obviously out on Friday was a little lower than expected. How are you allocating capital these days? How has the strategy changed sure. in the last year? Well, first of all, I, let me just say, when you have a strong economic environment, that does not necessarily translate to a great investing environment. Um, valuations are pretty much very high right now across the board. Um, in terms of how we are driving returns, I think the most important thing to understand about private equity these days and private capital really is the nature of our returns has really changed over the past 20 years. It used to be a long time ago you'd buy a company. Uh, you buy low, you sell high. Right. Or you <laughs> or, bought a company, anyway. right, you put leverage on it, and because of financial leverage, you could juice up the returns on the equity. It turns out that at least at Carlisle, 60 to 70 percent of all our returns now are generated by just fundamental top line growth, efficiency, corporate improvement, really creating value. So, so, so start with that, that uh, the nature of the job has changed and what we do has changed. Um, in terms of where we're seeing opportunity, we take a very long-term orientation. We have the luxury of being able to do that. And we are of the view 
we have to be able to drive this value improvement in all these companies because we're paying up for all these companies. Mm. Nobody is getting great bargains or deals in, in today's market. Yeah. Um, we're seeing great growth in China. We see tremendous opportunity in carve-outs uh, and, and very complex and large transactions out of corporations. And we're also seeing an interesting genre of deals where they are private companies. They would have accessed the IPO market uh, maybe 10 years ago, but they feel that partnering with private capital is a much better way to go. And so we're seeing, I would say, growth opportunities in much later stage, large private companies that continue to want to be private as opposed to wanting to become public. Yeah, it's public. interesting. It feels like more and more companies don't want to be public. Yeah, that, and the numbers bear that out. Uh, you know, at its peak in the U.S., um, there were, uh, you know, 600, almost 700 IPOs today. Uh, latest 12 months, about 120, so dramatically down. Throughout the, the world, you're seeing uh, public equities fall in terms of the number of stocks even ab available to be, to be purchased. So very much, I think, the role of private capital is expanding. Uh, that, that's not to say there isn't a role for public capital. There surely is. It's just that we can provide so many new solutions in terms of trying to help management companies grow their businesses, that there's a real value add that we provide partnering with these private companies and enab enabling them to continue their growth without the scrutiny of being public. Yeah, so tell us about some of those partnerships. From an industry standpoint, you've had your hand in energy for a long time. Yes. Are you still expecting oil prices to be up and, and, and the business of fracking and uh, gasoline development? Is that still one of your big focuses? Uh, I'm, not a, uh, I'm not a predictor of oil or gas, but I can say over the past several years there was a tremendous pullback out of the energy sector, and we think the sector still has underinvested for the capacity that it does need to provide to meet right. demand. So I do think there are opportunities, broadly speaking, uh, in energy. Where else? What are the industries that you're mostly invested Healthcare in? Healthcare right? in general, globally, right. uh, I think is, is, has, is tremendous. Uh, clearly, the convergence of technology into, be it consumer, business services, even industrial sectors, I think all present tremendous opportunities. It's changing every industry. Technology Absolutely. is. There, you know, we have a saying at Carlisle, there is no deal that is not a technology deal. Do you want to lower your exposure to places like Europe, given that the, uh, the, the growth levels are not as high as we thought they would be at this point? Um, uh, you know, we do not think about investing from a top-down perspective where we're saying, let's just allocate X, Y, and Z. Right. It's very much a bottoms-up, company-by-company, investment thesis-by-investment thesis uh, approach. And so I guess my question to you would be no. Uh, we still see plenty of opportunities in, in Europe. Um, it's just a matter of finding the right management team with the right company and finding the right thesis that we're, we're excited about. And, and, and China, um, you, know, you, knew the, you know this region well. Uh, we were questioning 6% growth anyway, 6.5%. But when I hear 5% as it relates to China, then I start thinking, wow, something has materially changed. Right. Well, you know, I, I do think that it's a smaller economy than the United States. Relatively speaking, the tariffs will probably hurt China more than the United States, just in terms of aggregate numbers. Um, there has been, uh, like I mentioned before, uh, a little bit of a, of a drop in, in confidence in the consumer sector. And I, you have to imagine that in, con, uh, in combination with the wealth effects that I talked to you about, where the markets are down, real estate prices haven't really gone up, that may all start to be having an effect. But also, China has been an amazing success story. Yes. It's grown uh, unbelievably well for so many decades. And 5% ain't bad. All right. We, we will leave there. Kusang, it's great to have you on the program. Thank you for having me. Congratulations on your success. Uh, Kusang Ali joining us there at the Carlisle Group. Thanks Thank so much. Thank you very much. Don't go anywhere. More Wall Street right after this. Welcome back. Now a look at some of the big market events coming up in the week ahead that could impact your money. It is another busy week for second quarter earnings, certainly. Monday kicks off the week with Tyson Foods, Hertz, Weight Watchers, SeaWorld, and Marriott all reporting second quarter earnings. On Tuesday, we'll get some economic reports released, such as the JOLT report, that is the job openings report. Uh, and Consumer Credit also out on Tuesday. Some big media companies reporting their earnings on Tuesday as well. Discovery Communications and Disney are due out with quarterly numbers. Analysts are going to be watching for any details on 
the impending deal for many of 21st Century Fox's entertainment assets uh, by Disney. Speaking of 21st Century Fox, Fox Business Parent Company, it will report the very next day, along with the New York Times, fashion retailer Michael Kors, CVS, and Prudential all out on Wednesday. Media earnings continue on Thursday with News Corporation, Viacom, Gannett releasing quarterly earnings as well. We will also get on Thursday the weekly jobless numbers, as we always do. We're going to look at inflation when the producer price index is out, along with wholesale trade. Wrapping things up on Friday, investors get a look at the federal, judge, uh, the federal budget, as well as the consumer price index. Another look at inflation. Coming up next week, J.P. Morgan Chase's chief economist, Anthony Chan, is my special guest. We'll take a look at growth in the economy here in across the world. And then join me on Sunday morning over on the Fox News Channel for Sunday Morning Futures. We've got a big show uh, with uh, Congressman Peter King, along with former Democratic vice presidential nominee Joe Lieberman talking to me about Iran. Catch the program live 10 a.m. Eastern on Sunday. And then weekdays right here on the Fox Business Network. Join me weekdays at 6 to 9 a.m. Eastern for Mornings with Maria. And uh, that'll do it for us for right now. Thank you so much for watching. Have a great rest of the weekend, everybody. And I'll see you again next time. I'm Bob Massey. For 35 years, I've been practicing law and living in Las Vegas. Round zero for the American real estate crisis. But it wasn't just Vegas that was hit hard. Lives were destroyed from coast to coast as the economy tanked. Now, it's a different story. The American dream is back. And nowhere is that more clear than the Grand Canyon state of Arizona. So we headed from the strip to the desert to show you how to explore the new landscape and live the American dream. I'm gonna help real people who are facing some major problems, explain the bold plans that are changing how Americans live and take you behind the gates of properties you have to see to believe. At the end of the show, I'll give you critical tips you need to know in the messy memo because information is power and the property man has got you covered. Thanks for joining us. I'm Bob Massey. One of the greatest aspects of the Internet is its ability to connect people to each other. It's now changing how people use their homes with countless sites popping up that allow you to turn your property into a short term rental. It was born out of uh, just an idea of, of renting out a couch that facilitates a transaction between host and travelers. And uh, now it's just exploded. There's home away. Flipkey, VRBO, Rumorama, and of course, the biggest and most well-known, Airbnb. Airbnb redefined and expanded room capacity throughout the world. It shifted the economic models of the lodging and travel industries and tourism destinations. The growth of Airbnb has been staggering. Two million rooms. If you take a look at Marriott, they have maybe 750,000 rooms scaled very, very fast over a very short period of time. Bob Cox had a large shed on his desert property outside of Cave Creek, Arizona. He decided to turn it into a rustic yet modern cabin. The floor is recycled pallet wood. This is a door from an industrial building downtown uh, Phoenix. He tore out much of the walls and installed garage doors on both sides, which opened up to completely bring the nature in. The concept here for the kitchen is to have an open plan uh, so that you can prepare a meal here and your guests can s sit at the stools. So we've got this interactive indoor-outdoor kitchen. Bob listed the cabin on Airbnb and says that it's been great. People who've stayed here have a unique experience. They have the openness of the house. They can eat outside. He says so far, every guest who has stayed here has been wonderful, and they have really enjoyed it. Some of my guests say this has been the best experience of their life. It's that unique. You can go to the grocery store, you can go to the restaurants that are five minutes away. There's the same exposure to the area, but the privacy of being in your own space. There's a fireplace stove, there's an outdoor fire pit, there's horseshoe pits. The cabin provides a truly authentic and private desert getaway. Almost everybody that stayed here likes to hike, enjoys wildlife, enjoys the desert. You have an authentic experience that you're not going to get from a hotel that's downtown. 
It's out in the surrounding community, and many folks really appreciate that. Some people just can't handle the thought of strangers living in their homes while others embrace it. I'm really open to having people stay in my home because it's just stuff. It's all replaceable. Rachel Hillis and her family often rent their house out through Airbnb. I am so thankful for this website because by opening up our home, that gives us the ability then to go and travel, which I think is key to a family. They have traveled all over the world, staying at other people's homes. One of the trips that I loved was when we went to Florence as a family. We were able to rent an amazing castle for about $145 a night. Each got our own rooms. So how does it work? You have to fill out a profile. There's going to be a list of possible places with descriptions and something about the host. And you can read through what people have posted so you feel comfortable. I stayed the first time in Paris using Airbnb, and it was a really easy process. Just clicked on um, the map of Paris and clicked where I wanted to stay. And there are many people out there who feel like you can't really get to experience an area by staying at a hotel. I could do laundry, had my own bathroom. I could open up the windows and see the neighborhood that truly made me feel like I was in Paris. What's really critical is trust in this whole process. When first meeting our visitors, we meet them at the door, show them around the house. I've had absolutely no problems. All the people have left the cabin the way they found it. This is our welcome book that we created, our family picture, and then a list of area foods and drink places are for favorite places to go. Airbnb is a unique culture, I think. Part of it is the way guests review the host and host reviews the guest. So it keeps it honest for both of the people. If you are thinking of doing this, you have to check the rules of your apartment complex, HOA, and local government laws. It's all very new, but suddenly the laws are catching up. Every state, every locality could be very different in terms of, of the rules and regulations, so you really have to be on top of that. In the state of Arizona, the governor recognizes that this could be a great revenue generator, but in other places it could be up to uh, you know your HOA, your city, it could be your lease agreements. San Francisco law currently states that you can only rent out your own primary residence. Airbnb recently agreed to crack down on people listing multiple homes in San Francisco and said it will kick hosts off the site who turn homes into private hotels. Cities like New York have banned rentals of less than 30 days to try and crack down. Like Uber drivers who are suddenly caught between being a carpool and a taxi cab, people now are finding themselves to almost be amateur hotel operators. You know, you're like a quasi-professional because you're not a business, you're not a person, you're kind of in between. So you, you've got to be familiar with the laws and the rules and the regulations. So the hotel competitors are just going to have to figure out how are they going to compete. They may get into shared alternative accommodations and the chess moves uh, are on. Up next, I'll take you behind the scenes of this National Historic Landmark that may have changed the way you live without you even knowing it. The home of legendary architect Frank Lloyd Wright. Welcome back. I'm Bob Massey, the property man. Ask any American to name a famous architect and I'll bet you hear only one name, Frank Lloyd Wright considered the greatest American architect. His concepts on how we live, how homes are designed, uh, was really revolutionary. Wright was born in 1867 and was already working as an architect by the time he was 20. Over the next 70 years, he designed pretty much anything you could think of. Residential homes, schools, churches, skyscrapers, even museums like New York's Guggenheim. He started practicing in the late 1800s, and he really broke away from the traditional models. He really changed the way things were built and how people lived in America. In the 1800s, Victorian homes were what Wright called boxes within boxes. Square house, square room, you open a door, go into the next square room. He blew all of that open. Wright wanted buildings in the United States to have their own character, one uniquely American. 
So in 1937, he bought 160 acres of land in Arizona and built what he called his winter camp, Taliesin West, right here in Scottsdale, Arizona. He had been here in the 20s working on the Arizona Biltmore Hotel, uh, fell in love with the desert. It was just, for him, it was just pure geometry, the rocks of the mountain, the form of the plants. This was his laboratory. It was a place where he came and experimented with architecture. Today, it is the home of Frank Lloyd Wright School of Architecture and the Frank Lloyd Wright Foundation. And the property itself, it's a work of art. Wright built to the human scale. Everything in the desert is low. The trees are low. Um, so his buildings are low. He also uses the low ceilings to kind of push you through spaces, right? At an entrance, drop the entry real low, and that helps push you into the space. It's a little technique he called compression and release. We call this the garden room because you sit on the bench here, and he frames the view of the mountains uh, in the distance. He captures the garden. He uses this Japanese technique called the borrowed landscape. He lived the way he believed, and he designed the way he felt things should look. It's almost like a seamless transition between outdoor and indoor. Even if you didn't know what he did, it was from when I was a kid, Frank Lloyd Wright, you knew this guy was an icon. And why did he become such an icon? Well, you know, I think he was a bigger than life personality. He really wanted to revolutionize the way Americans lived. And you hear about people that write music and it's always in their mind, the lyrics and the sound. When you see the things he designed, it's got to be the same type of genius. He would walk around and just create the whole building in his head. And then he'd go into the drafting studio, sit down at the table and just pour it all out. The entire compound sprawls over 491 acres and was constructed over a span of 20 years by Wright and his apprentices. So this is the drafting studio. This is where you know, the Guggenheim was designed during the Depression years. He didn't have a lot of work. His wife said, if you can't create architecture, why not create architects? And so they started the school. When you come to Taliesin to study, you're fully immersed in architecture. Uh, you're living it every day. You'll see the students working in the drafting studio, uh, cooking in the kitchen, setting the dining room. And the students have been working in this space, the apprentices, uh, continually since 1932. Now they're learning by being completely immersed in the, uh, the buildings of Taliesin and Taliesin West. Talk about immersive learning. Just as they did in the beginning, the students live in the desert in structures they make themselves. When Ray first came here in, in 1938, there was nothing here. So he purchased these canvas tents for the apprentices to live in while they constructed Taliesin West. As they had free time, they would expand on the tent, maybe add a wall, add a concrete floor, until it kind of grew into a shelter. And then this tradition continues on in our school. Uh, the students build their own shelters. We live out in the desert, and that's a way of engaging with the natural environment and knowing how to respond to the climate through architecture by living in it and being subjected to it day after day after day. Over time, Taliesin West expanded to include studios and performance spaces. He designed the music pavilion. Music and dance were always an important part of the community. Uh, this building was constructed in 1956. The apprentices would uh, put on a performance, open it to the public. Uh, you could come up and see the show. This is the Cabaret Theater. After World War II, right uh, in 1950, constructed the Cabaret. It's built down into the ground. It's a wonderfully acoustic space. From any spot in the theater, you can hear even the tiniest whisper coming from on stage. It's all concrete, but there's no echo. You can't design a commercial kitchen if you've never worked in a commercial kitchen. You can't design a restaurant if you've never served. So on these formal evenings that they would have, the apprentices were in charge of making the meal, serving the meals, uh, setting the uh, tables. You have to understand what you're doing, and the best way to do it is just do it. The signature feel of Taliesin West is desert intensified. We wanted Taliesin West to feel like it had just kind of grown out of the desert, and it kind of had been here for all time. If you kind of look at these masonry walls, and you look at the floor of the desert, and you just imagine tilting up the floor, that's what these walls represent. Taliesin West is preserved as a national historic landmark, and members of the public arrive every day for guided tours. We have over 100,000 visitors a year that come through and get to experience this jewel that Wright created in the Sonoran Desert. Up next, I received an email from a couple who's been trying to buy a home in a short sale. 
but getting the run around from the bank. I'll go meet with them next. Welcome back. I'm Bob Massey, the property man. I received a letter from a couple named Noreen and Sean in Tucson, Arizona. Nearly a year ago, they put in an offer on a house that is listed for a short sell. It's a property I used to play when I was a, a child, seven, eight years old. A lot of memories. A lot of memories. A lot of good memories. Yes. The property that they want was bought by the current owner in 2006 for $600,000, right before the housing market collapsed. It's now worth just a little over half that. He had a situation of losing his job, so they tried everything they could to keep the property, but they realized how much we care about it and that we're going to take care of it. Now, to your knowledge, when was the... I understand that they vacated the property how long ago? Going on two years. They haven't even made payments for a couple of years. Correct. The home has been empty for two years and is slowly falling apart. It's dilapidated. There is no landscaping. It's horrible. Mother Earth is taking over, if you will. Now, a short sell is when you're selling a piece of property for a value less than what's owed. Chase Bank serviced the mortgage, but the actual note was owned by Fannie Mae. Noreen and Sean put in an offer, but the same day, the note was sold. At which time, when Fannie Mae realized they made a mistake, there was an offer on the table, they had to buy it back. And over the course of a few months, Noreen and Sean went back and forth to the bank with offers and counter offers. So much frustration, a lot of emotions. We're, we're just a, a, a piece of paper on somebody's desk. They don't know us, they don't care about us. Finally, an offer was accepted, but the same day, Noreen and Sean sent in their assigned paperwork, the note was sold yet again. The owner accepted it, we accepted it, we all signed on it, the bank didn't. At which time, they sold it again. It's been an emotional roller coaster. We have storage units full, we're, we're ready to go. And uh, this house, this note, the piece of paper just gets shifted from a uh, financial institution to another one, to another one. Even though the seller agreed to their offer, it still has to be approved by the new holder of the note. The seller really wants you to have this property. Because he knows I'm passionate about this property. Because of the history of it. Because of the history, he knows I'll take care of it. He's a great guy. Here's a perfect example of two people who have had a meeting of the minds. The seller and the buyer. You're willing to pay, he's willing to sell. But in this situation, we have a third party involved, which is why the short sale process is so frustrating. We've been in this process for seven months now. So in seven months, you've literally had three servicers of this loan. Yes. That you've had to try to negotiate with. Correct. Yes. There's also a second mortgage and a judgment on the property. The judgment they've negotiated with, they're willing to go away for a sum of money. Okay. They're going to have to negotiate with the second. They don't seem to be budging. Even if the second mortgage decides and says, we'll take $10,000 to write it off. Let's say they owe 200000 The big issue for the seller is, will that first and second mortgage waive the balance as what's owed on that property? Remember, on a short sell, assuming the lender agrees to sell the property for less than what's owed, the key for the seller is that deficiency, the difference between the actual value received and the money owed is what you want to have waived. It's the second mortgage that has many times caused the problem. So if, if they accept it and they waive, you got a deal. Then you close escrow and life is good. You get the property, the seller walks away from the debt, and that's it. If on the other hand, the answer is no, the answer is no. Right. And the frustrating part for so many Americans that went through this process is they saw a ready, able, willing buyer that made a good offer on that property. The lender turned it down, foreclosed on the property, and sold it for less than what the offer was on a short sell. Don't even ask me to explain why and how. It makes no sense. My vision is a wraparound porch around the whole thing. This house could be so beautiful. I could feel the emotion in your voice and I don't know how you walk away from this and, and how you're dealing with the idea 
that you may not get this. I'll get it. It saddens me every day that I drive by this property knowing it's not being taken care of, Bob. If you come back in a year or 18 months after I'm in here, you wouldn't believe your eyes. We're going to follow Sean and Irene's story and we'll let you know if they ever are able to get this property. Time now for the Massey Memo. I received an email from John. It was his first house he bought in Texas. His mother flew down to help him set up the house. And when they were in the kitchen, John's mom said, you know, this kitchen's very dark. What's the story? So they started walking around the house. There's two windows on the outside part of the house. It was covered with bricks. And the inside of the house, where the kitchen is, the cabinets covered up the windows. What's amazing is probably in his excitement of buying a home for the first time, and it happens to all of us, they never saw it. So we're starting a new segment on the property, man, called Property Bloopers. So send us your pictures of any property bloopers to propertyman at foxnews.com. Can't wait to see them. That's all the time we have for today. Be sure to send me your property stories, questions or pictures of your property bloopers. Send them to propertyman at foxnews.com. And don't forget to check us out on Facebook and Twitter. There's also plenty more information and videos on our website, foxnews.com slash propertyman.